We now live in a world where everything stopped making sense. Physical irresponsibility has become a thing of the norm. It's okay to murder babies in the womb, but we must ban all firearms because life is precious. While at the same time, we should defund the police and allow criminal activity a means to prosper. Ladies and gentlemen, you have not entered the twilight zone. You are in the United States of America. We are living in an inverted reality. Welcome to the Common Sense Conservative Show with Chris Wyatt, Todd McKinley, and John Grosvenor. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Common Sense Conservatives. I'm Todd McKinley. I'm here with John Grosner and Colonel Chris Wyatt uh, from New Hampshire and PA, uh, respectively. Uh, so tonight we're going to have a great discussion. We're going to be quick about this. So we've had some technical difficulties as we got started. Uh, but I think, John, you you had a great topic you wanted to start off with tonight. Is that right? Well, yeah, I was kind of uh, thinking about um, uh, fear-based leadership. You know, it seems to me that uh, it's nothing new in politics uh, uh, or media or, or marketing right. is, uh, you know, the old head and shoulders uh, commercial where uh, they used to tell you about how socially ostracized you were going to be if you didn't get your head and shoulders and all those flakes on your shoulders and yada, yada, yada. But in politics, it's worse. Politics, it's, it's awful when they use something to say like COVID-19 as a means to manipulate people in order to persuade people to do things they otherwise wouldn't do or accept things they otherwise wouldn't accept, like taking a vaccine that's really to be poignant about it useless i mean what's this vaccine going to do they tell you well you take the vaccine and you might have a 77 percent chance of uh actually being vaccinated <laughs> it's like well, well then why am i taking the vaccine and everything they describe is just a, a flu bug to me and uh it's incredible what what we're seeing happening in politics today and how it's being used to manipulate us to make decisions we normally would make on our own or choose to make uh, they've done this, um, they use all, quite often uh, regulatory processes, uh, especially dealing with trucking and such. Uh, I see this all the time is for the better interest of the public. And you hear this all the time. You know, 40,000 people a year are dying from automobile accidents. 40,000 people a year are dying from gun-related accidents. Uh, and they turn around and they're saying, we got to stop this insanity. And first of all, it's not the government's responsibility to protect you from gun accidents to protect you from driving accidents it's your responsibility ultimately you know they even is correct me if i'm wrong but they have a process in which uh, uh you always hear it militarily but do you hear it politically is um uh what do they call it collateral damage you know do we pass this law uh how many people are going to be affected how are they going to be affected uh what do the impact studies say and if it's only such amount then yeah okay we'll pass the law if we're going to have ten thousand people die a year but it's going to benefit you know us politically, if it's going to benefit us financially, then we'll pass the law. And it kind of gets ridiculous because they're using fear that your life might be at risk if we don't do something. And uh, I think, uh, oh God, an old and great, um, I, I don't mean old as an age, but she is, she is a little elderly, but Raleigh James used to say that. They always say, it's for the children. How many times have you heard that? It's for the children. So I thought maybe if we could elaborate a little bit on uh, uh, fear-based politics, how it's impacting us, and uh, um, and how it's misused. And I don't think it's just the United States government either, or, or politics. Well, I, 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 I look. I, I accept it. I'm. I mean, I did. I learned very clearly. I saw Joe versus the volcano, and I understood there is a real threat out there, and we need someone to take care of us. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, John John Kennedy back in the day, you, you know, you had this person who who led by uh, not necessarily by example, but just because they were such a great speaker. You know, you, you wanted to follow them. You know, that the type that type of leader. You know, General Patton, for example, was a different type of leader. He's you know, a, a, a old, old blood and blood uh, and guts, I guess. You know, his blood and our guts, I guess, what they used to say. Uh, but he he would leave because you were scared as hell of him, but but also you respected him. And of course, you had a guy like Eisenhower, for example, that you know. Uh, Never, never served actually in combat, but he's a guy who you know who just inspired people just because he was that old grandfather figure that you just loved. You wanted to follow him because you know you thought he had all the answers for some reason. Do you know that Eisenhower was a captain for twenty years? Yep, and he he was <laughs> contemplating on whether or not he was going to get out of the military at one point when he was a major working in, as a staff officer in D.C. Yeah. Well, he was well a, if I'd have been a captain for twenty years, I would have contemplated a lot sooner than twenty years. I, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, you see Joe Biden, you know, he, out there on a regular basis. You see people from the, you know, the, whether it's the WHO or the, um, you know, the NIH that says, well, if you go get your vaccine, you know, you can, then you can go do these things right here. Uh, you can go participate. You can be around family. You can be around the elderly. You can have a 4th of July. But if you don't get the vaccine, you know, you need to stay locked down or you, you can't go out in public, basically. You know, it's, 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 it's one way or else. Uh, and of course, the, the threat of the fact that they want to talk about the uh, the COVID uh, passports that they're talking about, which is something that I think that they would honestly that, that w- would absolutely do, uh, probably through an executive order or something like that. But you see, the airlines obviously are enforcing things like that for travel uh, or, or going into uh, stadiums uh, watching a baseball game. I was in LA and then, of course in San Diego the last couple of weeks and watched some baseball games there. And they had the COVID section, they had the vaccine section, and of course they had the, the non-vaccinated section, which was the, the, the cheaper seats. Uh, so you have private industry that's uh, enforcing basically what the government would like to do uh, right now, I believe. What puzzles me is is um, influenza typically kills 0.15% of the bows infected each year. With the figures now continue to trend down for, for this pandemic, and it's approximately 018 to 0.2%. Uh, so two tenths of one percent versus point one five of uh, of one percent. We don't require vaccination certificates for influenza. We don't. Right. We don't even harass people if they don't get it. It's their choice. You know, it's funny how the left likes to say, "My body, my choice," but not on this issue here. We we don't even require passports for people who have active tuberculosis we don't we don't lock them away in leper counties they're far more contagious and dangerous to public than anyone with this um this this whole fear-based thing is 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 really off the charts it's shocking how little attention is paid to things i mean everything else is shut down i mean where is the discussion about the traditional vaccinations the traditional development of vaccines where you take the rna you kill it so that it can't actively attack you. Then you put it in a vaccine, you inject it in the body like we do with influenza and all these other things. Why aren't we talking about that? There's no discussion. Are any of these companies even developing? We don't know. It's all this modified ribonucleic acid. No discussion of the normal way that we've done vaccines for years. And it's not like they could say, well, it didn't work because they didn't try it. They just went right to this modified RNA. There's no discussion of that. There's no discussion of rationality. Also, interestingly enough here, the United States now has reported that 50% of our population is fully vaccinated, not one dose, fully vaccinated. Yet England puts us on a travel list, and they've only vaccinated 34% of their population. Germany is is, is discriminated against our travelers, and they've only vaccinated 4% of their population. I'm confused. What's this really about? Is it about a pandemic, or is it about power? Well, obviously, it is about power. That's power and control in the hands of the few, the elite. That's what I say, uh, and that's really how Democrats, I, I believe, operate. Uh, and you have Republicans on as well, cer- certainly a certain establishment Republicans who, who, are, who are in the same vein as well, uh, who, who think that their way is better than anybody else, that they're the smartest person in the room, that they should be deciding what's best for you and your family, what's in the best interest for the people in your community, people in your circle, whatever it may be. Uh, and if you don't uh, conform, well, you can't go and do these things because we have a regulation in place or we have some sort of uh, legislation that's already been passed uh, that's going to prohibit you from actually going out in society for, and participating. And you have a lot of companies that are uh, enforcing this on their own as well, uh, kind of doing what the government's uh, too afraid to do, I, I believe. Uh, in, 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 in essence, if you will, it's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the fascists of, of old uh, just modernized for the 21st century. Uh, and, and but in a lot of respects, I do I do believe that private industry has the uh, the right to say, hey, you can't come into my store if you don't have a mask on or what have you. Uh, but at the end of the day, are you following science or is this something that, you know, 
that you, you're just doing because you, you, you're the people that you back in Washington, D.C., the people that you donate money to, this is what they really want you to do, and this is what they're telling you to do in, in the whisper campaigns, uh, but they don't want it to get back to them. as, as, as So, that, so they're, they're not the bad guy, if you will. And, and at the same time, they've already eliminated all the competition from the mom and pop stores anyway. So really, you have a few big box stores that are competing amongst themselves who have a lot of the same shareholders anyway. Well, it's interesting. I predicted exactly this over a year ago when all this uh, hysteria started. And and the perfect case of it I saw playing out very quickly was in Cape Town, South Africa, but I talked about it here in the U.S. too. You know, it's uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, um, all these rules that Congress puts in place that are wholly unnecessary because they simply need to in- enforce existing laws. But all these things they put out there require unnecessary accounting. You know, the small guys get buried by this. Before anybody says, wait a second, Chris, uh, small businesses, less than 50 employees don't have... I'm not talking about small business. I'm talking about the growing businesses get over 50, over 100, 200, 300 employees. That's the lifeblood of this economy and, and of Germany's economy as well. And when you put in all these onerous requirements on them, you bury them. So, you know, big corporations love no competition. They love that environment. Uh, cable companies are very happy that they don't have to compete with other cable companies. They can set whatever rates they want. And what I predicted last year has come true. Specifically, the issue of Cape Town. So when this pandemic started in South Africa, they locked people down in late March of last year, the 27th of March, I think it was. You can't leave your house. They arrested 230,000 people out of a population of 59 million for violating the curfew. And I mean, things like walking on a sidewalk. They arrested a gentleman for being in his own yard, which had a fence around it. A wooden fence. They, they went into his, the police did, and arrest him for being in his own backyard. It was absolutely insane. And what happened was no one went to restaurants. No one went to bars. And so what happens? The small business owners who spent their lifeblood building up a business, creating a business, making it profitable, building a clientele, they couldn't make rent or couldn't make their mortgage payments, couldn't pay the utilities. So they were, they were at a loss. What are you going to do? Go bankrupt? Or when the rich guy who's got billions there sweeps in and says, you know what? I'll buy your business for 40 cents on the dollar. And that's exactly what they did. So now most of the independent restaurants and bars in Cape Town, South Africa, are all owned by a handful of incredibly rich people who could wait this, this pandemic out for 50 years and not even feel it. They've got that much in the way. Recently. Meantime, tens of thousands of people don't have jobs. Hundreds of business owners have lost everything they put into it. And the same thing is happening here. Foreclosures, businesses collapsing. And people who are really hurt by this is not just retail, but also people who own property. People not paying a rent. And you can't take any action against them for not paying rent. And frankly, you know, you kind of feel bad if you try to if they don't have income. But it's just a total disaster. And it has everything to do with government interference, everything to do with government. You know, uh, as I mentioned last week's show, we had a situation where Don Kiefer talked about a workforce crisis. And now we've seen John Stossel come out and write an article talking about almost the exact same terminology, which is what I've been talking about. The perverse incentives to not get people to go to work is undermining our economy and it's cratering our civil society. And they don't care. They'll just do it. And you got you got signs up everywhere. I see signs up for fifteen, fifteen and a half dollars an hour. They can't find the labor because people don't have to work. They're paid not to. Yep. And it's it's perverse because what they're doing is they're undermining the dignity of work. Dignity is work. I had a guest on my program today, Kendall Qualls, who's from uh, Minnesota. He's a former army officer. They got out as a captain, artilleryman. He um, was a very successful healthcare industry professional. He's a black American, and he's fe- he ran for Congress. Uh, he's, he's, he's fed up with the destruction of the nuclear family in America, especially in the black community, but in America in general. So he right. started a new organization up there. So I had him on my program today, and we talked exactly about these issues, this is exactly what we talked about. And he said, you know, he said, you know if, if you want to fix America, let people get back to work. The right. dignity of a job, people earning their way in life, really goes a long way, and and those are wise words. No, absolutely true. And Jessica here in the comments, she goes, uh, "I was in uh, the dollar store today, and they had a sign up saying only vaccinated individuals can remove their mask in stores." And I'm, well, you know, obviously, how, how the hell are they going to know what, whether you're vaccinated <laughs> or not? And uh, you know, I say remove your mask if you want to, wear a mask if you want to, uh, but you know, the the science obviously doesn't support. Wearing a mask all freaking day uh, in every situation, it's, it's absolutely asinine. Uh, wear, wear a protective mask in the appropriate situations when necessary, certainly. You know, the military, obviously, we wear M40 protective masks when appropriate, whenever we're doing training or if we're in a situation whenever, where it would require something like that. Other than that, why, why would you wear a gas mask all day long? You know what I mean? Uh, unless you're just trying to trying to mess with the troops. So but why, 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 why wear a mask, you know, that's covering your, your nose and, and, and mouth uh, all day long, creating all sorts of other health problems at the same time. Uh, you know, fo- follow the science, I say, 
Uh, but the science doesn't support having a mask on 24-7, 365, wherever you're going in, in the country. Uh, it just makes no sense uh, at all. And, of course, what are the other problems that it's going to create? What are the other health problems that it's going to create in the long run? And at the same time, you have government that, that sees that, well, these people are going to follow this blindly. What else can we get them to do? What else can we get them to do willingly uh, to themselves? Uh, you know, we see each other turning on, on, on one another on, on a regular basis, you know. Oh, well, you're, you're an anti-vaxxer. You're anti-mask. You're anti-science. You're anti-this. Whatever it may be. Uh, so we end up fighting amongst ourselves uh, while, the, while the people in Washington, D.C. or people wherever they are in, in your government, whether it's a, a state level or local level, uh, you know, they're sitting there tw- uh, twiddling the thumbs, kind of uh, laughing, if you will, saying, that, you know, l- look at what these idiots are going to do to themselves. And th- th- that way they're not focusing on what the hell I'm doing uh, behind the scenes over here, kind of maybe robbing the, robbing the, uh, the, the till, if you will. Well, it's uh, it is interesting how easy it is to get people to act as agents of the state when they have no authority to do so. I mean, people hitting other people, assaulting people for not wearing masks, people uh, attacking people's homes. It's utter nonsense. So, you know, Rand Paul utterly eviscerates Dr. Fraud in a Senate Mm -hmm. hearing and his reward is death threats to him and his family. What is wrong with these people? This is absolutely insane. This this whole thing is upside down. I've always got a kick out of these people running around science, 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 science. And these are the same people saying that people, because their skin pigmentation is darker, should get disadvantage over people. It's not darker. Why? Well, because 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 historical justice is well, that's not scientific. That's cultural. That's social. That's that's a political decision. You've decided who the winners and losers are based right. on an immutable fact that no one can change. I can't be black, I can't be brown. You know, not unless I roll around the dirt and that's not real. That washes off. Hopefully, you know, this is that these people know have no idea what science is. These climate change zealots and religious nuts run around. They right. have no idea. America's air and water are cleaner today than they've ever been since the beginning of the industrial period. Obviously, before that, they were cleaner. But, you know, this is ridiculous. We have we have unbelievably clean air and water. Yep. Uh, when I was a child. We were frightened into believing the Chesapeake Bay was going to die. And it was in bad shape because of the effluent, the sewage, the industrial waste poured into it from the estuary of the Chesapeake Bay. And the oyster uh, crops were way down. Crabs were down. Mussels, everything was going down. And then because of a concerted effort for the last 45, 50 years, the Chesapeake Bay has not only survived, it's come back. And here's the funny thing. The number of people living in the estuary that, that, that feed or the watershed that feeds into the Chesapeake Bay estuary has quintupled. Yet the water is cleaner and safer now than it was then. Right. It's our carbon emissions have gone down year over year, except from 2011 to 2014, for the last 20 years. Even though we didn't sign Kyoto, even though we're not part of the Paris climate scam, we, we've seen these things go down. And these people who pretend to believe in science don't even go, wait a second. Wait, wait, how did that happen then? What, what, improved technologies, new right. equipment, new boilers, new, new heating systems, new vehicles. You know, it's, they, they're, they're just zealots. They have no yeah. idea what science is. They wouldn't know what science is if it bit them in the ass. I, I Whoa, have, science. Across the board, everything. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Oh, I just got to say I have seen in the regulatory uh, process where they have used uh, uh, scientific studies that, that the government pays for through universities. Right. And they they, they, uh, they claim one thing, but when you look at the study, it's really an incomplete study. It's, not, it's inconclusive, and it doesn't really state one way or another. They just basically some of it what they need. Use yeah, they, cher- they cher- cherry pick what they want, what they need. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah. absolutely. And, and basically, we've solved these problems because of the private sector, uh, you know, the, the, the demand of, of the public, what what businesses want, what we, we as individuals want as consumers. Uh, all these problems have been solved because of things like that. We created the problems because of consumerism. And now we're solving them because of consumerism, because of the, the free market. Uh, not because some government regulation said to do this or that. I mean, government regulation tells you to, to have, have a war on poverty. Well, poverty uh, goes to the roof. Ha- have a war on uh, drugs. Well, drug use and, and people dying of drugs and you know, the cartels go through the roof. Uh, so anytime the government turns their sights on something, obviously the problem, usually the pro- problem gets worse. Well, wasn't it, well, wasn't to, it to, Bloomberg to, that stated uh, uh, to keep people impoverished is good because it reduces consumerism? <laughs> well, well, yet they talk about ass. sustainability. Any, anything and he's got to say, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. But to be to, to be fair on the environmental front, I mean, honestly, um, if we're fair, if we're completely honest sure. about it, there, there was a time when 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 large corporations um, were Absolutely. not held responsible for their actions, and and a lot of them were irresponsible. We have Love Canal sure. as a consequence of that. We have strip mining in Appalachia. We're thinking, yep. but but that time was 40, 50, 60 years ago, and this country has righted the ship against those things. Right. 
I mean, when we were kids and we watched Iron Eyes Cody, the Sicilian American pretending to be a Native American, crying on, you know, yeah. you know, yeah, well, <laughs> the, I mean, the commercial. I mean, yeah. Right. America was in that condition then. Lake Erie, I mean, like, like the, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland caught on fire. That's right. how polluted it was. And, and things were like that. But this country turned a corner. Now, a, a lot of that, to be fair, even though I'm a small government guy, was a consequence of government intervention. But the, that intervention has gone from intervention to fix a clear wrong to intrusion into things that are not wrong yes, for right. ridiculous outcomes that are unachievable. When, when Bush came into office, just before he came into office, Bill Clinton signed Clean Air Act, or Clean Water Act, and it reduced the parts per billion or parts to a ridiculous level that it's not even achievable. It's not even in nature do you find water that way. Right. So, so immediately Bush rescinded and he was attacked as a polluter. He wasn't a polluter. He simply went back to the standard that was there for seven years and 10 months of Bill Clinton's administration. Right. But these people are just such lying sacks of manure and they have no idea what they're talking about. They have no idea what science is. You know, it's frustrating for me. I was a farmer. I know what it's like to be a good steward of the land. We had forests. We took care of our forests. We took care of our watershed. We, we were responsible for what we did. We didn't overuse things. We tried to restore the land. And that's what people should do. I mean, you know, just be good stewards of the land. But these people think we should all live in a cave unless the cave is occupied by bears and then we're stealing it from bears. So we must right. move out and live in the open. Ah, they're just a bunch of it's, – it's a, it's a religion. It's an absolute – just like – the pandemic is a religion by ill-informed witchcraft believing yahoos who would be the same people that are in the Monty Python movie. She's a witch. Burn her. She's a witch. <laughs> witch. Yeah. yeah do, that's, the, 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 that solves yeah, all problems. Know, yeah. Yeah. How do, how do you know she's a witch? Look at her nose. They put this nose on me. No, we didn't. Did you <laughs> yeah. Put, yeah, we, we did the nose. We did the nose. <laughs> yeah. Well, if she floats, she's a witch. If she doesn't float, she's a witch. So <laughs> no matter right. what, she's a witch. Hey, that, right. That and what, but what floats? What floats? Wood floats. And what do you do with wood? Burn her! Burn her! <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, absolutely. And, of course, I, I think the, the, the fear-mongering or the fear, fear-based leadership that you talked about, John, is probably still going to continue because it, it works so well. It's something that people can, can uh, revert to on, on a regular basis. And whether it's, whether it's a, a COVID-type crisis or whether it's something else, that's, it, they're always going to get somebody uh, to, to, to divide, to be tribal, to, to retreat to their corners and to not actually focus on what the heck's going on in Washington, D.C., uh, but to just basically buy into it, uh, you know, because it's for our own good. Uh, so let's just go ahead and do it. It's the same type of people that have no problem with, uh, you know, n- no warrant, uh, you know, uh, intrusion as far as spying on Americans. When they say, well, I have nothing to hide. I don't have a problem with it. It's like, well, you, you probably do, but you just don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, yeah, but, but regardless, if you have nothing to hide, regardless, if you're not doing anything illegal, why are you investigating somebody? Why are you spying on me? Why are you doing all these things, collecting my data and all these things? Uh, you know, it, it's none of your business uh, anyway. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's those types of people that just pay no attention to anything. Uh, and again, I always refer back, revert back to the people that don't pay attention to politics, that are not involved, uh, that they're not involved in, in any sort of political organization, whether it's a, at the local level, state level, or especially at the federal level. They may vote every so often in, in a general election, but that's pretty much the, the, their involvement is that, is that and that's that, and that's it. Well, right now, you know, we see this thing that happened over here. They call it the January 6th insurrection. And right. they've used this tool. And that, I mean, that's what it is. It's a tool. They, they invited these people into the Capitol building. Then they turned around and arrested them for insurrection, which they did not do. And then right. they turned around and started attacking uh, uh, fellow members of Congress that are on the conservative side, uh, censoring them because they spoke right. out against it, because they spoke out against the left. And here again, now you get remaining conservatives that are afraid to speak up because of the minority in the House. Now they're yeah, afraid well, to speak of, up because they'll ahead. be attacked. No, no, go ahead. I, that was it. Yeah, so, but instead of focusing on what, what, the, what the, the people in the House and the Senate were going to bring up, uh, you know, which was obviously voter irregularities, whether, whether or not you believe you know, the, the, the election was stolen or not, that, that's besides the point. There were a lot of voter irregularities. There were a lot of states that actually uh, didn't, didn't abide their own voting laws. Uh, so instead of point, being allowed to point those things out, uh, you, you say, well, let's look at the, the, the attack on our democracy. You know, our democracy is about it was in trouble. It's going to fall because a few people were, were fighting the police or were fighting amongst themselves or were breaking things or trying to break into the Capitol. Uh, you know, so the country was about to fall. It, we're supposed to believe that. I mean, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, why are we focusing on, on that? And, and, and we can focus on more than one thing at once anyway. So we can focus on the January 6th issue. Not a problem. 
but let's also focus on the irregularities and let's go to let's go fix them to make sure that they can't happen again. And that way nobody can say that in the next election and so on uh, that it was stolen or whatever it may be, because we will have we will know that the issues that 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 cause the irregularities have been taken care of. They've been fixed. But we can't it, talk about that. It, it comes a time when we as a people need to stand up and demand greater drink just the election alone as you brought up you know we we feel like the election was stolen and when when trump became president the left was saying the election was stolen well both sides feel that way let's do something about it make sure the election's fair why don't we have 24-hour monitoring at the polls with cameras they can put cameras in a truck they can put cameras in your car they can put cameras on the street corners they can tell if you run a red light we can't have cameras 24 7 monitoring they don't have gateways so that you can tell if information or data is going out through the internet and coming in through the internet to these devices they're, they're not if they're connected why don't we have something to monitor these, these devices things? should not even be connected to the right. internet exactly. i work with the national security agency it's not secure it's not preventable uh um this is ludicrous to even even have this conversation not, not us but anyone to have a conversation mm-hmm. about yeah. electronic voting it is so susceptible to fraud and it's just as stupid as well here just here's a drop box at the 7-eleven just drop your ballot yeah. there <laughs> no there's no chain of custody what right. kind of morons are these? As a former federal law enforcement official, how can you consider breaking the chain of custody? And people are like, what do you talk about chain of custody? Well, when the voting, the Board of Elections mails you a ballot through the U.S. Postal Service, that's a chain of custody. U.S. Postal Service is legally accountable for right. that. And arguably, well, although they're not the best delivery service, they're a, they, a reliable and trustworthy service. And register mail is just that. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you send in your ballot through that, then there is a chain of custody. It can be traced. We can find markings on it to find out where it came from if there's a question about validity of it. But when people just rock up and drop things in a box, I mean, what is that nonsense? Or, it's or as you- stupid as the as – the, the argument that um, black people can't get ID cards and vote. Well, I don't know. How do they get their, their prescriptions at CVS and Walmart? How do they buy booze? How do they buy cigarettes? How do they cash that paycheck at the bank? How do they have a credit card without identification, let alone drive? Or right. get on a plane. Oh, yeah, I guess black people don't do any of those things in this country. Yeah, right. Talk about the culture of low expectations, the insults, and the, dis- and the disgusting concept that black people lack agency. They're, they're naive waifs that someone must take care of. It's right. unbelievably disgusting and insulting. Now, I don't know yeah, who to put on it. Oh, go, go ahead, Todd. Yeah, folks, if you if you have a uh, comment or you want to call in, Question. we have the, the numbers up. It's 551-241-6957. Again, 551-241-6957. Call in, uh, ask your questions, or if you have a, 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 a an issue you want to bring up or, or, or chime in, by all means, call us, and uh, we'll get you, get you on, on live here. Yeah, or just yeah that'd be great to have a call in. If you, if you feel like you have something you, you uh, feel like uh, input. But uh, I don't know if it's relevant or if, it, if it's uh, – um, the adequate, uh, uh, accuracy of it or not, if it was just to put on, but there was a guy who did a YouTube video, and he went around asking uh, uh, all these uh, people, white people particularly, about uh, black folks not having identity and not having cell phones and access to computer right. technology and stuff. And right. Like, oh, yeah, they're so unfortunate. Yep. Yeah, you seen this video? And then when he went to ask yeah, black I people, they were astounded. Right. They're going, there's my cell phone right here. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. I, yeah, of course I got a yep. cell phone. What do you think? I'm from the Stone Age? Yeah, yeah, I saw a couple of those. Uh, Waters, uh, this Waters World, he he did a video like that, and then a few others uh, I've seen before. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I can't believe that anybody doesn't have a cell phone in this country when I have to pay seven dollars and forty three cents out of my phone bill every freaking month, which is about six percent of my phone bill, so that people can have free phones given to them by the fe- by the federal government. I right. Say Obama uh, I, I know, made of course, sure they lots had of. One. Yes. I mean, I, honestly, people don't know about this program. It's uh, good. Maybe they won't take advantage of it. But they've been fleecing us on our cell phone bills for years to give phones out to people in a scam. And I don't think that's right. You know, if people want a cell phone, they, it's, it's not they should go get one of their own. I mean, they're dirt cheap and you get deals with providers. But but yeah, exactly. That whole thing. People obviously have cell phones. Hey, if I, I got a topic real quick before somebody calls in. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Absolutely. Folks, it is it is Memorial Day weekend. We're, we're approaching that just this weekend. This yep. evening, I was out locally with uh, my post where I'm now the senior vice commander. I was elected to that post two weeks ago for uh, my Veterans of Foreign War BFW post. And we went out and placed flags at the graves of U.S. veterans. Now, these aren't folks who fell in combat necessarily, although some of them did, but it's U.S. veterans in general. It's interesting. I came across a grave of one of the founders uh, of a town near here, and um, he died in uh, – well, he was the grandson of a founder, but from the same family family. He died in the Indian Wars out in the West, and um, another who died in the War of 1812 and is buried in Ontario because they didn't bring him back, but the gravestones are here. But uh, we, we talk about Memorial Day to recognize um, uh, those who have served. And um, 
we have uh, Veterans Day, which is for that. But Memorial Day specifically talk about those who fell in combat. But right. we, rep- we, we, we celebrate it not just for those who fall in combat. We also look at those who served. And that's why we were at the cemetery laying this out. We had a good crowd of about, uh, I'd say, 20 people came out, which was a really good turnout. Unfortunately, it started raining, but we were almost finished. So we just got soaked at the end. But uh, in, in, our, in our country, we've lost uh, war dead from all ethnicities, all religious backgrounds, throughout our history. And just a quick rundown of some of those who've fallen in uniform for this country, either through combat-related or, or through illness in, in war zones. The Revolutionary War, 25,000 casualties. The War of 1812, 15,000. The Mexican-American War, 13,300. The, um, the uh, Civil War, 655,000, which is our single largest loss of life for soldiers. Then we had the uh, Spanish-American War, 2,500. The uh, Philippine insurgency, the Philippine uh, conflict went on 4,200. World War I, 116,000. World War II, 406,000. The Korean War, 37,000. Vietnam, 58,000. The Gulf War, 879. And then Afghanistan, 2,126. And Iraq, 4,497 uh, of our fallen brothers and sisters who, who served our country to save this great republic or to create it in some cases. Right. Uh, and so just uh, I think that people need to remember in America, all too often people lose sight of what the 4th of July is all about, but they really lose sight of Memorial Day and and um, Labor Day uh, and, and Veterans Day, but not my Labor Day, excuse me, not Labor Day, but Memorial Day and Veterans Day. People lose sight of Memorial Day because it's the start of summer vacation. It's mm-hmm. the first big barbecue and beach right. holiday. It's not about that, folks. I appreciate that we all go. We have a long holiday, but I really appreciate it for those who recognize, participate in parades this coming Monday and, 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 and remember those who serve this country. And the same thing when it comes to Veterans Day, which recognizes all of us as veterans, not just those who've fallen. Uh, those are important dates. And this is the greatest republic. Um, it is. And, and for those who doubt that, then you're just delusional and you're not really well informed. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely. We're, we're comprised of homo sapiens and people are fallible. If we were imperfect, we'd live forever and we do what we want with no consequences. But that's apparently only progressives ought to do what you want with no consequences, but they don't live forever. So I just want folks to remember that this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. Uh, have a safe weekend, whether you're traveling. I'll be going to Atlanta, uh, or I've been invited to come down for the uh, the Memorial Day celebration that the Atlanta ATL rugby team is having against Los Angeles. So I'll be flying down there on Friday and spend it down there. And then I'll be back here uh, to be with my post on uh, Monday to, to celebrate Memorial Day. But please, folks, don't forget um, those who serve this republic with great dignity and helped us have the republic we have today. And don't let this narrative, because this nonsense that's going on in this country is not America. It's not even a, even, even a significant minority of America or Americans. It's a small, vocal group of woke jackasses and their, their allies in the media, in Congress, all of these people who have an agenda, who are elites or want to be elites, and they want things for themselves, they don't care about you. They do not care about you, and they'll do anything they can to keep their place there. Now, obviously not everybody in all those organizations is complicit in this, but enough of them are that all these institutions are turned against America. Our education system at primary, secondary, tertiary level, our our Hollywood, which used to be conservative for for decades, uh, television studios, news media, cable, newspapers, politicians, all of these things have been, have been turned and, wep- and big tech weaponized against Americans. But take hope. Most Americans don't believe in this nonsense. Most Americans don't believe in this BS about systemic racism. Uh, there are still things that are wrong in our country. Nothing's perfect. But let's remember those who fell for our country. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Heck yeah. I second that. Absolutely. And I'll be in D.C. I'm going to try to go by the um, uh, Arlington National and pay my respects there as well. So. I have a couple friends buried there, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure you, you probably do as well. But uh, Arlington's amazing. By the way, for those who don't know, the Arlington National Cemetery is Robert E. Lee's farm that was right. taken from him, confiscated, and turned to a cemetery <laughs> for Union Dead. Uh, for the Lee family lost that property, which they'd had for over a century, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. But, uh, but I think the government did pay his like grandson or something, uh, or uh, yeah, a small amount for, for taking the land, I guess so. Sure, but I, I think that uh, if the Lee family would be able to hold on to it, say, until about the 1980s, they'd have been worth a couple hundred million dollars Whoa, at least selling them. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yep. You know, uh, so, because, go ahead, John. Because, because these uh, ladies and, and men sacrifice so much, we have the opportunity to speak here today. You know, they protect our freedoms. And uh, those who served and those who've fallen, um, 
alike, of course. Uh, and uh, when you get into things, because you were talking about um, the elite, and it reminded me of the World Economic Forum and their statement towards the Great Reset. I'd just like to read this about their section on the opportunity. And it states this here. As we enter a unique window of opportunity to shape the recovery, this initiative will offer insights to help inform all those determining the future state of global relations, the direction of national economies, the priorities of societies, the nature of business models, and the management of a global commons, drawing from the vision and vast expertise of the leaders engaged across the forum's communities, the Great Reset Initiative has a set of dimensions to build a new social contract that, uh, that honors the dignity of every human being. When I hear a new social contract, what I'm hearing is international socialism. <laughs> well, when, when I hear a, a, something like that, um, the dignity of every human being, while well, these governments actively seek to discourage people from working and being responsible citizens in their countries, I call bull bull. <laughs> <laughs> But and this was all based off COVID because of the COVID-19 crisis. And this is what we're getting about fear-based leadership. They want to indulge themselves on the idea that they can create a boogeyman, a beast of slaughter, if you will, so that they can coerce us to believe in a new agenda. And this, this new Green Deal, this is all part of the UN agenda. This is all part of the leftist agenda. And this is all being contrived. It's, it's, nothing, it's, it's like going back in time to the New Deal, but it's modernized. It's just a, it's it's a scam entirely. I mean, first off, like I said before, these people would know science if it bit them in the ass. First off, you go back twenty years ago, the world, United States was the world's largest carbon emitter, no question about it. But China has jumped well past us with an economy half the size of ours and produces far more pollution, which was eminently predictable, and many of us did predict that. Yet, no one questions that China doesn't have to participate or conform to the Paris Climate Accord, uh, but we do. Or Brazil doesn't have to, or Russia doesn't have to, India doesn't have to, but we do. Why should we be punished? Well, well, that's because you, know, you, you, you took advantage of the Industrial Revolution. Well, okay, well, then let's let the Russians, Chinese take advantage of the Digital Revolution where they don't have to produce all, produce all this carbon, and let's let them get there. You know, it's just it's, – uh, these people can't string two thoughts together, and they just – and they come up with these empty arguments all the time, and the, the facts stare you in the face. You know, this, this – this, uh, well, it's – first off, remember, it was global warming for years, global warming. Right. And yeah. uh, that, 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 that couldn't – they couldn't sell that, so it became climate change. Well, if climate change no, no. today, I was in the broad sunlight, and then suddenly I got drenched five minutes later. They, they, I'm being facetious. They did wait, sell it. They, wait a minute. They did sell global warming for a long time until people said, wait a minute. It's freaking freezing out here. Oh, wait, wait. Global right. warming. No, no. Now it's climate change. They keep climate, changing yeah, it as, absolutely. as things progress. Yeah. And well, I, I, okay. No, go ahead. I, I, was, uh, I was at a doctor's office the other day, and I saw, picked up a Time magazine. And I was flipping through it, and, of course, on the cover – it said, you know, about the, the uh, maybe, maybe not on the cover, maybe it was a, an article inside of it, whatever. We're talking about, you know, how the storms or the hurricanes are getting, you know, more worse, intense. you know, more intense every, every year. And I'm like, you know, and if you, you talk to anybody who's actually knows anything about the weather or has a degree and, and has studied this, they'll tell you that that's actually just not really the case. Uh, we have more people living on coastlines nowadays, which obviously creates more problems whenever a hurricane does hit. But you know, the the hurricane intensity actually has not increased at all in, in the past, you know, 100 years or so. Well, I mean, do these people just conveniently forget the loss of the Spanish treasure fleet that sunk off the coast of, of the Florida Keys because right. of the incredibly intense storm that sank like 200 treasure laden ships? There's <laughs> okay. many ships that, that lay at the bottom of the ocean like that. Exactly. You know, it's uh, a couple of years ago, Cape Town in South Africa was experiencing a major drought. They were virtually out of water. Their reservoirs were like 2% water capacity. Ooh, climate change, climate change. No, okay, let's point out a few facts here. Uh, they have the tragedy of the commons in these townships that are not regulated, that are made for poor people, or they spring up out of nowhere. They have public taps and people just leave them on. Guys walk over, fill their bucket off, walk so they can wash cars, make a few bucks, and leave the tap running. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of gallons of water rush out of there. Then 30 to 40 percent of the water in Cape Town is lost through leaky pipes that haven't been replaced in 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Then there's no groundwater reusage program. What's the groundwater reusage? Well, the fact that they don't even know what it is tells me they don't know what they're doing. Groundwater reusage is taking the runoff, filtering it and using that rather than, you know, than using chlorine to treat it so you can drink it. So it's not it's not potable water, but it can be used to water lawns. It can be used to do to wash cars and things like that. And so there's no policy. And then they also forget the obvious thing here. 
in 1910, when South Africa became a country, there were approximately 300,000 people living in the Cape Town area. Today, right. there's 3.5 million people. Do you think those 3.5 million people who all have showers today and jacuzzis and they cook co- or they make coffee and they cook with water and we have an industry there and a wine industry, do right. you think that might have something to do with why there's not enough water? I mean, you know, it's like Sam Kinison said, these people live in a desert. Move! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well you, you can apply what you just said to California. You think about that. L- L.A., yeah. for example, has takes water from the farmland m- many hundreds of miles away and yeah. has, it, has it piped into Los Angeles in, the air, in that area. Uh, and you wonder why there's not enough water to irrigate you know, the farms and, and so forth and why there's not enough w- water to go around to the millions upon millions of people that live in just one clustered area, never mind the entire state. You know, wh- wh- you but think about that. Don't, don't forget when California wanted to conserve the water and keep the sun from evaporating it, they decided to fill the lake full of ping pong balls. So they chose black. Right. But, <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> the same <laughs> uh, well, actually, actually those, to... those balls... Those balls do work, but you have to have the right color. Why yeah. would it have been more appropriate me? for reflective? <laughs> yeah. uh, Leland has a pretty good question there, Todd. I, I, I think I think okay. you're probably the person to answer that. Uh, correct me if All I'm right. wrong, but I don't think President has any power to put us, mean USA, into a treaty without approval by senators. Well, yeah, that's absolutely correct because uh, you had the advice and consent of the Senate. Uh, so, yes, yeah, as far as treaty is concerned, yes, that's true. That's that's right. That's why the, the Senate is the senior body in the legislature. It has the checks directly yep. on the in the executive branch, and we cannot enter. That's why SALT never became and SALT two never became treaties. Right. Uh, the, the the Reagan and Bush administrations agreed to them, uh, which is fine. That's a prerogative, but it has to be ratified by the Senate. Democrat controlled Senate, Republican controlled Senate. None of them voted for it. Obama illegally. Now I say illegally because he can sign an agreement on the Paris Climate Accord, which he did. Sure. But when he takes action through executive action to enforce it, that's a crime. He took executive action through the uh, Environmental Protection Agency to issue executive orders and directions to the bureaucracy that forced Americans to do certain things. That's a criminal act that violates the Constitution. He should right. be in handcuffs right now defending himself. That's also court. the epitome right. of dictatorship. Uh, Cheryl, um, you, uh, in regards to your statement about a, a worse hurricane last year, you do have these unusually uh, uh, storm seasons, and they come mm-hmm. and they go. And a lot of things about climate change uh, in regards to climate change is nobody really understands where what exactly uh, – uh, um, if they're worse or not worse or what's causing things like some people think right. solar there's a solar cycle that causes different things that might create worse hurricane seasons there's different uh, uh um aspects and um so what they end up doing is they use semantics so when they want to when they want to uh, uh determine or come with a come up to an outcome that they desire so yeah. they interview 74 76 whatever it is global scientists geoscientists and they get the, the certain percentage, the 75% or whatever it is of them, to agree that climate change is caused by, is man-made, caused by men, da-da-da. And uh, so that's what they go with. So it's basically a semantics in their survey. Out of, what, 36,000 geoscientists they could have interviewed or they could have put out there their survey. They only picked 75 or, or some odd number like that. It was less than 100. Well, they also take half truths, guys. I mean, right. for instance, yeah. look. I mean, additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over a certain level is a problem. It right. is a problem. I mean, when the dinosaurs lived it here in the tri- lived here in the Triassic, the amount of, of of carbon in the air was very different than it is today. The amount of oxygen was far greater than it is today. So, if we had a lot more oxygen, things would not be so good. Oxygen is a toxic substance. We, those of us who consume oxygen for energy and for life, have learned to adapt to the levels that are on Earth now, and they have been for several million years. But you go back further during the time of dinosaurs, there was a lot more oxygen, which made sense. I mean, the dinosaurs were huge. If they were taking in oxygen, they need a lot more oxygen than we do. And, and, you know, the levels of carbon dioxide, it's fascinating. There's no discussion about how much carbon dioxide is actually used by plant life. I mean, right. remember, it's, it's, it's a dual key system. We, ex- we exhale carbon dioxide. The plants take it in, for, use it for photosynthesis. They produce oxygen. We love oxygen. There, there is a balance there. And that's never part of the conversation. They never talk about the increased amount of vegetation or how, much, how many more forests are growing and that sort of thing. Also, with climate change, whether it's natural or if somehow magically we were able to change the climate on our own, which I think is pretty impressive. And I think it's pretty arrogant of humans to think we can do that. But, but even if we were able to change it, just because there's climate change, I mean, look, the Sahara wasn't always a desert. Right. 10,000 years ago, the Sahara was a lush, 
beautiful place. There were lions and elephants there, not even 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. There were still lions and elephants in the Roman times in North Africa, although it had become demonstrably drier. Now the Sahara is a vast desert with virtually no water, but look underneath the Sahara. It's the largest aquifer in the world. Why? Because it was a tropical place at one time. Right. But the climate changed. So when the climate changes now, guess what? People living in Nunavut in Canada are going to have some nice beachfront property. Somebody's loss is somebody's gain. The problem is Todd got to and alluded to is that, you know, and this is what's bothered me about insurance rates for years. I have USAA for insurance yep. and I get hit with higher insurance rates for my house in a safe place, not near tornadoes, not in a fault line for earthquakes, not near storms and not near hurricanes. Yet these people build McMansions all over the Florida coastline yep. and lose two, three million dollar houses and the co company loses money. And then my rates go up because we are tempting nature. That's why we see these horrific amounts of damage go back to 1860 when there was a hurricane on the gulf coast nobody lived there they were all inland growing cotton and sugar and and rice they weren't living there so this is often forgotten we we live in a fashion that puts us at risk and then right. we blame climate change for storms that happen that's just asinine yeah right absolutely now, you know, yeah going back to what you said earlier people can influence by population so uh instead of climate change looking at pollution if we're all going to burn dirty diesels, right, we're going to have fluorocarbons in the atmosphere. If we put fluorocarbons in the atmosphere, we might have people more asthmatic. Uh, if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, at the beginning of the Industrial Re Revolution, especially in London when they were burning coal, coal was a common heat source, and they created more fluorocarbons in the air. So bad it was smoggy. It was like fog. You, you know, people were just choking on it. So we can influence uh, as far as pollution goes, we can influence certain things, but I don't think it's all global. I don't think London was influenced what's going on in China so much as they were influencing their own environment. It was well, there's, there is, there is, there, that's a fair point. But, but the, I mean, if you look at photographs, historic photographs of London, it's disgusting to look yeah. at how filthy the New York City, yeah. how filthy the air is, all the pollution coming out. But I mean, but look, there, there are global things that, I mean, for instance, one of the reasons why we have such productive farmland in America is a lot of people don't know this. It's because of the Sahara. What do you mean it's because of the Sahara? Well, because the sa the, gra the grain and the minerals that are in the, sa in the soil or the sand in the Sahara gets lifted up in dust storms up in right. the stratosphere, yeah. and it gets carried by winds over to North America, True. and it settles here. And and you know we don't see it; it's microscopic, but it comes down and it has an impact. It actually fertilizes uh, our continent. So thank you, the Sahara Desert. If it yep. wasn't the Sahara Desert, we wouldn't have that. I mean, we'd probably still be fertile, but it really makes a difference. So there are some things that contribute to the globe, but but they always take half truths and they take half stories and they run with it, and they never really run down the facts and talk about things in in the aggregate. I mean, it's it's symbiotic. Everything plays a role, and they use these words, but they don't know what they mean. They're just it's just, it's well, it's it's comical listening to them try to create this narrative. And and I have yet to run into a so called you know progressive that knows what they're talking about that I can't. And I, I'm not I'm not a climate climatologist i'm not a meteorologist right. i'm not, but i'm just a, a human being with a decent education who can think critically and i just tear yes. their arguments apart absolutely you yep. know but the one thing they don't talk about is what comes from outer space i mean years ago there was this discussion i remember that uh, there are things like viruses and other things that can ebb in to our atmosphere from outer space and also make it well we, we we have found on astro or not asteroids we have found on comets now we found right. we found that the, the the land of the land of con we have found the precursors of what's necessary for for life and so yeah it's very possible that um that things come from space that affect us but but yeah the uh you know the thing i always worry about now this is this is kind of kind of not a way a little bit of topic but all the debris that lands in the earth and it's a lot every day a few tons of debris come in from you know um they just burn up in the atmosphere and the things that land on the surface um at what point do we get so much we start slowing down and when the cycle of the earth starts slowing down it's got to happen <laughs> eventually i mean that's a lot of stuff <laughs> means the earth is getting bigger right yeah and so it's going to get bigger there'll be more drag we'll slow down that will the moon the moon by the way the moon is slipping away at i think it's like two centimeters or or yeah. two millimeters per year or something yep. like that absolutely yeah. but then that yeah. goes but not with, in our that lifetimes goes, that goes with the big bang theory right did you guys see the expanding? um the blood red moon did you see no. the blood red moon? We, we had cloud cover here i couldn't see it, it was disappointing every time there's a meteor event or or a blood red moon event or something really fascinating an eclipse that's what we get is cloud cover it's disgusting i'm thinking oh we're yeah. driving on it i'll get to see it and what do i see <laughs> i see clouds yeah so i saw a few good photos of it but it looked really nice i mean from some people's advantage point uh, other parts of the world people in uh, out, out west and in hawaii i think had a good good view of it so yeah australia and new zealand had, had the whole show hawaii had the whole show um pretty much from the mississippi west it was pretty good for them um i had a nice little um time lapse animation 
showed the pattern as the earth turned and where it was at. But uh, unfortunately, I, I was under the impression that we were going to be able to see it in all of North America, only to get the refined estimate and find out that the line conveniently missed Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so let me let me go back to something we, we've been talking about. We talked about, you know, the environment. We talked about, you know, fear-based uh, leadership, if you will, fear-based government and political uh, uh, philosophy or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you think about this, we, since we're on the environment, EPA, for example, was set up by Richard Nixon, a Republican. Uh, it, it, but you have these presidents that will rule by executive fiat. They'll sign an executive order and they'll say, hey, EPA, I need you to go do these things and enforce these laws a certain way. And basically uh, in, in entitling them, if you will, or empowering them to go out and basically do the bidding of, of a, a political party uh, and justifying their existence at the same time and justifying the funding that, they, that, they, that they're going to want the next year. Uh, instead of the the fact that you know you set up the EPA or you set up a, a political or, or excuse me a government organization to do a certain thing, uh, once they have accomplished their task, they always have to figure out a way to ex- uh, justify their existence. So instead of cutting their funding or getting rid of them or saying, "Hey, stay in your lane. This is what you're set up to do. You you've accomplished that. Continue to maintain that." Uh, they always look for more, more things for them to go out and accomplish or go out and regulate, if you will. Um, you know, so that's just something we need to think about as well. And and we we never we never do that. Because our legislators have abdicated their role as legislators to the executive branch uh, and allow the, these executive branch agencies to write, write rules and regulations that have the effect of law. And at the same time, they get to go out and enforce those laws as the executive branch. And they also get to fine people or, or you know, companies or what have you, uh, essentially as a, a judicial system. And companies really have no, uh, no uh, recourse, if you will, unless they fight in open court, which usually costs more money than the fines actually – the fine actually is anyway. Uh, so – it's kind of the perfect storm here that we've allowed to allowed to happen uh, throughout our history. Well, we've seen we've seen Americans imprisoned in federal jails, federal prisons for violating EPA regulations. They're not law, but Congress, as you said, has uh, given away their responsibility and allowed the executive branch to create rules that that make Americans who are law abiding criminals. We had this I can't remember the exact story, but there was a guy here in Pennsylvania. Uh, years ago, back in the 90s, uh, he was um, an immigrant, I think, from Russia or somewhere in Eastern Europe. He bought uh, a piece of property and uh, he was, I think he was a, a junkyard or something like that. But or, or he, had, you know, he, what, he had a property. Anyway, there's a place next to him that was a junkyard and they had all these tires, these disused tires. They just dumped them in between the property in which was the lower spot where the water ran off. So he bought the property next to him and started cleaning up the lot because it was just full of trash and everything. Right. The EPA took him to court, sued him, and he went to federal prison as a convicted felon because he destroyed a wetland. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that is true. You that's know, you insane. Had, yeah, and if you I, – I, I don't have the – off the top of my head, I don't have the, uh, the measurement here. But if you have a, a certain area of your land that stays wet a certain period of time after it rains, that's considered a wetland. That's horse manure. Yeah, uh, wet, and, I know, but that's what the that's what the EPA does, and that's just that's that's a, it's an organization that's run amok and is out of control. I mean, that's just ridiculous to say that that's not what a, a wetland is. And, no. and this all stems from you know, I mean, there was a time here that we. Uh, so one of the reasons we got mosquitoes under control because a lot of people don't know this, but the uh, the tide water, uh, the Carolinas, Virginia, these were malaria endemic regions for right. a couple centuries here uh, after it came over from Africa it was here and it was resident people die from malaria forever but in the 1930s because of the civilian conservation corps and the government because of the use of DDT that came along we pretty much drained all these swamps and these places cleaned up all these places where water lay and we wiped it out well there was a consequence to that we got rid of malaria here it was no longer endemic but we disrupted the natural flow of water and we created right. lots of problems and that's one reason why the Chesapeake Bay got polluted. So what we did is, is uh, now, like in Maryland, when you build something, you have to have a retention pond nearby, which keeps the flow from running off, and it regulates the natural flow of water a lot better. But, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's pretty crazy how these people just you know, write rules, and people can go to jail for it. That's absolute insanity. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you, an everyday citizen. I mean, how are you going to fight it in court? You you, probably, you don't have the resources. You probably have you know your own bills that you have to pay for on a regular basis. You don't have money for a lawyer. Uh, and, and of course, if you do have to take a, a public defender, most of the time it's it's there to just take a plea and, and move on. Uh, and and people, in, especially individuals or small business owners, really have no recourse except to plead guilty or and agree to some sort of uh, you know fine or some sort of thing that they've worked out with the government uh, just to get past it and move on with their lives. Uh, which is you know it's, it's how it's how the government can easily destroy people. Uh, you know, e- very easily destroy people you know, through through regulations and regulatory agencies. 
Uh, regu- Absolutely. Regulations, by the way, do have the uh, force of law because there are laws right. that back them up, and that, that's what gives them the, the, I guess, their ability to to put people in jail based on a <laughs> no, regulation. No, no, no. Well, yes, yes, yes right. and no, John. Yes, yes yeah, and no. Sure. Yes and no. Yes, that's a true statement. But no, because the spirit of the Constitution is violated by Congress well, abrogating its responsibility it's, it's and giving no, a broad wait, category. Wait a, minute, wait a minute. No, it was based on the proper necessary clause, Article 1, se- uh, Section 18 of the United States Constitution. It was a proper necessary mm-hmm. clause, uh, given Congress the ability to de- delegate their powers. Absolutely. That's true. Okay. But delegating your powers should not result in the ability of a federal executive branch agency to arrest a property owner for removing rubbish from a piece of land that's been bespoiled by its previous owner by on the spurious claim that that was a wetland. Way, that's an abuse way, of authority. The way the, way the right. regulation process is set up is so, so – oh, what's the word? It's just so terribly bad. Okay? Of course. Uh, okay. Do you remember remember an executive order Trump had to create saying you can no longer enforce guidelines? Guidelines don't have any power of law. Guidelines are just suggestions. There is no right. regulation behind it. There is no law behind the guideline. They're just saying this is what we're looking for based on our regulations. Is, and then they turn around the and enforce standard. the guidelines as if they're law. And Trump says, no, right. we have to put a stop to that. Now Biden, of course, uh, uh, repealed his uh, uh, executive orders. So we're back to, we're back to that again. Um, so you're right. There's yeah. a lot of abuses going on when uh, uh, it was Roosevelt originally that was addressing Congress about creating this regulatory process. And it did fall under, uh, it got signed under, what, 1949 under um, Truman. And, mm-hmm. But it was Roosevelt who put together a committee. And the committee come back and said that they, they claimed it was unconstitutional. And they claimed that they're, they were, you, were, you were risking to create a fourth branch of government. Right, the it, bureaucracy. It's been, it's been abused terribly. I mean, it's just one of those. Well, to me, it acts like what a real estate agent acts like to the seller and buyer of a home, a buffer. Mm-hmm. So there's little negotiation. And that's what I think it is, is Congress has pawned off the responsibilities and all the blame falls on the regulatory agency. And Congress just walks away like, hey, look at me. I'm just all, you know, looking good over here, all sha and, and not, you know, I did nothing wrong. Right. When, when they well, they, by, by advocating their role many decades ago, it, it, every success of Congress obviously falls into that. And at the same time, what they do, they, they'll go out and fundraise off of the executive branch or whoever's in power, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. Uh, they'll say, well, it's, it's the EPA or it's the, you know, whatever it may be, Department of Transportation uh, or it's the person who's the president or whatever. Uh, it's mm-hmm. their rules, their regulations. They're the ones who, who are the problem. Instead of actually saying, hey, why don't I just pass some sort of legislation to address those issues. Uh, well, then that's not probably not going to get you any, any funds or, 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 or any, anything in your campaign coffers or probably won't even get you reelected because it's, it's so such a minute thing or, or, or maybe it's mind numbing or it's too hard to do uh, whenever it's uh, a lot easier just to go out and point blame at somebody and try to raise money off of something. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so but actually getting into the way there's very few members of Congress now at House and or Senate. Uh, that actually ex- get into the weeds with, with regards to regulation and the legislation and actually write it. A lot of times what they'll do, they'll just take it from, the, you know, whether it's a, uh, a lobbyist or whether it's one of these think tanks in Washington, D.C., they'll come with something already basically 98 uh, percent, you know, ready to go. And they'll, they'll, they'll add the last two percent. And, of course, they'll throw their writers on there, too, which is usually all the earmarks for money and things of that nature. Uh, but usually legislation is already written from somewhere else. So rarely does it actually yeah, get from, written in house lobbyist. From freaking lobbyists, they write it all up. They got it all ready to go. Just stamp, sealed, and delivered. Here you go. Just push it through. Put your name it's, on it's it. It's my agenda, yep. and I'm giving you a whole bunch of money for it. Yeah. Put ridiculous. your name. Put your name so, on it. And, uh, yep. I mean, seriously, it, we, we wrote the Constitution on two pieces of paper, and it sets the guidelines for this entire country. And the Unaffordable Care Act took fifteen thousand pages. Yes. Uh, yeah, that that sets all you need to know about how broken all this stuff is. But mark your calendars, gentlemen. Today is the day it starts. Today, a Dutch court ordered Royal Dutch Shell to reduce their emissions by 45 percent by 20. When is it? 2050 or 2030 uh, by 2030. So nine wow. years from today, 45 percent. Oh, by the way, it's not just their emissions. They must reduce. They must slash their emissions by 45 percent. That includes emissions from their operations you know, researching and and exploratory and drilling and transport and all the emissions that you burn in your car 
from their products. Come on, this now. is insanity. Yeah, uh, no, Royal no, Duck Shell. Is, what now, this is is a push to get you to buy electric. This is a push to get more innovation right, towards right. electric. Right. So let's let's and, let's destroy more mountaintops to get three pounds of a rare earth element, destroy an entire ecosystem uh-huh. to build yep. a battery for go. a piece of crap car that costs eighty thousand dollars and makes Elon Musk and rich. Forget, oh, that's that's a good scheme. And don't forget yeah. that electric cars have been around since the turn of the twentieth century. They had battery operated yes. cars. They've had yes. a modern, uh, electric buses. They still got buses out there in cities. I see them all the time. I've been down there to Cambridge, Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts. I've been to Philadelphia and seen all these overhead lines and these buses attached to them that are electric. If electric was the solution, then why has it not worked in the past? And why have so many cities taken electric out of the city? They don't for have the, the very electric simple re- For the very simple reason we have not found the magic bullet to make a battery that is durable and can pack the power that the internal combustion engine can pack. And yes. the, the ratio of energy return from batteries is ludicrously low. I mean, right. you get you get the most from any – I mean, it's not ideal. You get about 40 45% from internal combustion and the rest goes to waste. But that's far better than any of these other sources of energy. And they don't talk about that. They don't talk about that. They also don't talk about the fact that even with the invention – or the, the not the invention, but the inclusion of the catalytic converter, the amount of, of emissions from cars have dropped demonstrably and it continued to drop year after year. You know, it's interesting because so many people like to get on a high horse about this stuff. The Germans, I remember – because I spent many tours in Germany. Oh, Americans, you're polluters. Before the Greens became actually a party, they could actually take power. They're on the verge of taking power now. But, ooh, you're just such dirty planet polluters. And I'm like, excuse me. Why don't you go dig a, a couple pounds of soil out from the A3 Audubon outside the Frankfurt airport? What do you mean? Well, you're still burning leaded gasoline, moron. Right. <laughs> we stopped in 1976. It's 1992. Why are you burning leaded gasoline? The lead doesn't burn. It goes out the tailpipe and into the ground and into the water table. And you yep. geniuses. This is the same people that came up with the Green Dot program that said, okay, manufacturers of products, they subscribe to the Green Dot. It's called Grüne Punkt. You get to put this label on your product. And then mm-hmm. you're eco-friendly because you've contributed money so that all the packaging material gets returned and we recycle it. Except – when we discovered that what they were doing with the plastic was putting on barges and shipping it to Thailand and burying right. it in landfills, and then right. they got exposed. But the Germans, you know, oh, you dirty Americans, yes, yeah. I'm sorry. You know, the Germans are also the people still burning lignite, brown coal, the dirtiest forest source. We had anthracite and bituminous. They have no anthracite, they have bituminous, and they have brown coal, lignite. They destroy the ground by ripping up the lignite, right. like peat bog in Ireland. They rip it up, destroy the ground, and then they burn the stuff. And it's horribly polluting. And they look down their nose at us. And then they have all these nuclear power plants, which are relatively clean, certainly by compared to other. What do they do? Let's see. Fukushima. Ooh. Well, they had, they had a nuclear disaster. Well, any moron that builds a nuclear power plant on a on fault other- line, on <laughs> yes. a ring of fire, ought to have yes. their head checked. So <laughs> right. what do the Germans do? Let's see. What fault lines are there in Germany? There are, there's fault lines on the whole planet, but it's not sure. on a serious plate. There are no serious plate tectonics affecting Germany. So what right. do they do? They eliminate all their nuclear power plants. Why? And they replace it with windmills that they use rare earth elements to make. They destroy the environment. They take away the aesthetic beauty. They take away billions of dollars worth of tourism value because nobody wants to look at these things. They kill lots of birds. And then they do with solar photovoltaic panels all over the damn place. And – Gee, Germany, it's well known for its vast amount of sunshine. We know how bright and sunny Germany is. I mean, if it was so bright and sunny, they wouldn't spend every century invading France to get to the right. beaches in Central <laughs> Bay. I always thought that the future of energy was in hydrogen fuel cells. If you can separate No, water, no, 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 man. It's like a cold fusion, man. That cold fusion mumbo cold jumbo. Fuel, oh, God, that? that goes way back to the day. But I always thought it was hydrogen. The problem with hydrogen is anybody can create a hydrogen generator. Therefore, uh-uh. they can't tax it. That's right. And, 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 and all the big companies go out of business who are making energy. <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. Right? If, I could take, if I could take a liter of water in my house and fuel my house for, for a week, no one's going to make money off that. Right. And that's the problem with it. Uh, I don't, well, it's like vehicle mileage tax, right? As, as soon as everybody's electric, they charge a vehicle mileage tax. They're getting the money out of EV anyway. Uh, yeah, they're gonna, they're, there's always a scheme to get you to, to pay more, whatever it may be. You know, just, that's yeah, what I'm whether saying. It's electric, give me the free energy. I'll pay the tax. I'll just pay the damn tax. Just give me the free energy. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Oh, man. Yeah. But, and, uh, and, and going the, back to – thi- oh, go ahead. Yeah, and to think that our problems in society, whether it's, you know, the, the environment, whether it's, you know, we we're going to use battery-operated vehicles, whatever. Whatever the problem is, whatever the solution – Government's not going to give it to us. Government is not our answer. So why why do we continue to to 
people in, in large amounts uh, turn to government to think that, well, they're going to fix this. You know, they ought to do this. They ought to do that. They need to fix this. They need to fix that. Well, if we go to the government and say we need to fix this or that and not give them the solution that we want or give them the outcome that we want, well, they're going to come up with something that you're not going to like. It's probably going to create several other problems in, in the long run that you're going to be back to them saying, hey, why don't we fix these problems over here? We didn't, used to not have those problems. Well, we didn't have those problems because, you know, you, you, you wanted us to – the fix that we actually applied created all these problems, uh, mm-hmm. and you, you wanted it. So, um, but anyway, government is not going to be our, our, solve our problems. Government is not the solution it, to really m- much of anything. Uh, provide for the common defense, you know, conduct diplomacy, be the arbiters between the state. Really, that's the few things that the federal government should be doing, and maybe, maybe a couple of little things here and there. Uh, but not running most of the things that affect every little aspect of our life. And we're, we've, right. we've thrown up our hands and allowed them to do it. So, so a quick summarization. Some of the regulations actually work. I mean, it's like, look at trucking. We're complaining about the electronic logging device. We're complaining about hours of service. There's a few other issues that we may have, but we're not complaining about hazardous materials rules. We're happy yeah, to yeah, follow yeah. those, right? Yeah. The same thing with well, EPA. Maybe There's some things but, in it that we're happy to have. But it's the silliness. Uh, it like, like goes back to lobby and such. Uh, it's a silliness because it suits an agenda. It's a silliness because the rich get richer off it. And that's what it's about. And then you've got these uh, – I don't know if you're familiar with the um, uh, Transparency Act where they have to report their earnings and their stock market uh, 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 mm-hmm. investments and such like that. You know, It suits their portfolio. You know, When you've got somebody but, in the uh, Transportation Committee that, that's involved in the transportation, what do you think their interest is being on the Transportation Committee? Well, John, the thing is, is that is that uh, not this this group here, not us. But I mean, when, when I have a conversation with people about the, the 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 merits of genuine capitalism, not the pseudo capitalism we have in right. America, but genuine capitalism, and they're like, oh yeah, you're lazy fair, lazy fair, no government. No, no, no. Who said no government? Who said no regulation? Who said no oversight? Right. That's actually the role of the government, whether sure. it's state, local, or national. I mean, look, you know, and the answer on Bernie Madoff is to come up with more rules and take more money off our stock trades. No, it wasn't. The answer on Bernie Madoff was to watch for scamsters like Bernie Madoff. The Federal Securities Exchange Commission only had 4,300 agents to investigate securities fraud. Do you know there's over half a million stockbrokers in this country alone? Right. There are, there are thousands of financial firms that deal in stocks and bonds. And there are 4,300 agents whose job, and that includes supervisors and everything. So the number is probably below that. At any given time, there's maybe 1,500 people doing cases. And you've got people like Madoff. The answer isn't to take more of our freedom. The answer is to have the proper level. And, and, and when you believe in capitalism like I do, and I get the feeling we all do, but certainly uh, Todd's nod his head, so he's with me on this. It's, it doesn't mean there's no role for government. The role of government is a well-regulated, a properly right. regulated, yes. not an over-regulated, not, a Im- impre- not, not impress- what's impressing form of government. That's, that's what we have. I mean, listen, you know, this whole housing market shenanigans that took place, I predicted it. I'm not in the financial market, but but in the 1990s, I owned stock in a company called Crimi May, which invested in collateral black backed mortgage securities, CMB, CBMS. And in the 1998 time frame, there was the Asian flu when all these Asian economies got in trouble. Well, the big banks started doing collateral calls because they were short on cash to cover these loans and such. Citibank was one of them. Uh, Crimi May, which was a Rockville, Maryland based company, a private company, wasn't state backed. They had three point four billion dollars of loans on the books. Well, Citibank said, give us the $3.4 billion by Monday. Like, are you serious? We have $34 million in our checking account. We don't have $3.4 billion. So they declared bankruptcy. I learned a very strong lesson about that, about finance and about leverage and about how these things work. And, and, and what happened is that if you – and that's why I was able to predict. I wasn't alone. There were other people. Thomas Sowell predicted. Others right. predicted. Yeah. So, that what was going to happen is this. And even Bush, Bush in 2005, speaking to Congress, said this. And then they blamed him for the housing crisis. He told Congress that you need to do something. And the reason to do something is because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which had the implicit guarantee of the federal government, had unfair advantages in the marketplace. And people are like, what are you talking about? Well, for starters, they weren't going to fail. Well, sure, they'll fail. No, they won't. Look, we yeah. spent $350 billion keeping it from failing, so we proved that they weren't going to fail. That's the first thing. Second is they had two masters. Congress chartered them to give money to disadvantaged they determine disadvantage or people who are non traditional couldn't get money. Well, no more than 15% of our population at any given time could qualify for a loan backed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So, why did they become a problem? They became a problem because they were also publicly traded companies. So, stockholders like you and me could buy their shares. And what do we expect? 
return. The price of the stock to go up because it's doing better and dividends, right? That's what we want. So they had to answer to shareholders. They had to answer to Congress. And you can't answer to both of them because they have very different goals. Shareholders want to make money and increase right. wealth. The, the government wants to ensure that they're giving away things to people who can't afford it. And that's what they're trying to do. So trying to p- take care of both those masters, they came up with a third way. And the third way was this. They were allowed to buy up mortgages. So they started snapping them up and packaging them together and buying and selling them. So when the housing crisis happened, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac owned 69% of private home mortgages in this country, even though only 15% of Americans could even get a loan through them. Right. They owned your home loan, whether you knew it or not. And when they couldn't pay their bills... The whole thing went down the crapper. And this was all a consequence of the government intruding into the marketplace, distorting market outcomes. And I haven't even talked about the unfair advantage. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, every time they went to the credit markets, because they would go to the credit markets like other banks to borrow money. And big you know, insurance funds and retirement funds would come in with 30, 20, 30 billion. Here, we'll borrow it. You give us a bond. We're going to pay you back. But guess what? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, because the government guaranteed that they wouldn't fail, always got that money at one quarter to half a basis point cheaper than Countrywide, than Washington Mutual, than Bank of America, all these companies. So they already had an unfair advantage for a company that's not even supposed to exist. And these intrusions in the marketplace are entirely the reason for the 2008 financial crisis that nearly destroyed the world's economy, not just ours, nearly destroyed, and brought in this useless piece of slime that became president for eight years because the sheep don't know better. How's that hope and change going for you, by the way? Right, absolutely. And, it, and it, you know, instead, instead of uh, looking at what the actual problem was and what the solutions are, they said, well, let's just blame Republicans. Let's blame Bush because, you know, he's in office at the time, uh, which obviously you, you can't blame the, the one guy who, ha- who happened to be there when it happened. You know, they blame you Bush. Actually for- warned people three years yeah. prior. Right. And, you know, they blame Bush for 9-11. He happened to be president for a few months or nine months, uh, you know, almost a full nine months whenever 9-11 happened. Uh, mind you, the Clinton, the, when the Clinton was in office, they had found out about the Plains plans uh, or the Bohica plan, whatever. The, I probably mispronounced that. But uh, anyway, they, they found out about that. They uncovered the intelligence. And you, you got to ask yourself, well, what were they doing up to that point? You know, but, you know, it's one of those things that we, where you want to blame the person who happens to be there at the time. Uh, so for, for the for the disaster, for the crisis, for whatever it may be, because that's politics. And then, of course, uh, politics nowadays is basically everywhere we, we turn. That's in every aspect of our life. Uh, but, but we have still people that refuse to participate. But anyway, I, I carried that a little further than I was going to. But anyway, uh, go just, ahead. I got to say, way to help the Bush didn't take a working vacation after he became president. <laughs> he did got to leave the oath of or he left. Uh, he left his office in D.C. and decided he's going to do things out of Texas. Well, in, in his his defense, uh, in Texas, he had everything that he could uh, had right. in Washington D.C. at his disposal. That packet that was sitting on his desk in D.C. was supposed to be his. Uh, did somebody didn't transfer it to uh, Texas. I don't know what you're talking about exactly. That was but, the uh, FBI packet uh, explaining about the uh, uh, up and coming 9/11 attacks. Uh, was, but but uh, the president, gets, the president gets a da- no, no, no. That, 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 there was, that there was be. a presidential daily brief that was written by a CIA analyst, which has been made public now, so I can talk about it. That yep. presidential daily brief was a standard warning that included yep. a sentence about a possibility of that being one sort of thing that could do. There was no concrete yep. evidence of uh, anyone that was being presented to the president about this. That's one of those lies that's been mm-hmm. told about nine yep. eleven. Trust me, I was Absolutely. there. I was in there. I was writing presidential daily briefs for the president of the United States. This is a bunch of horse manure that just, yep. you know, and people more, that more don't. media uh, influence. Yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah. And I could tell you, uh, I mean, I, I used to handle the, the president's daily briefing whenever I was on duty. I would take it to the vice president or Navy, Navy enlisted it. He would take it to him. Uh, or, you know, I'd go to the sit room and, and get it, uh, you know, daily summary or whatever it may be. Uh, so, th- yeah, that, that's completely false. I mean, the president gets a daily uh, briefing, intel briefing anyway from, from a CIA briefer. Uh, regardless, so so does the vice president. Well, it, it rotates now since after nine eleven. So oh, oh, one day, does it? Sometimes it's a DIA guy, sometimes it's CIA, sometimes it's NSA. But yeah, CIA owned that process until after nine right. eleven. I mean, right. think about it. We had eighteen intelligence agencies, most of them in the Department of Defense, and only the right. CIA ever briefed the president. And that didn't start until Johnson. Before Johnson, there was no daily brief the intelligence the, intelli- right. the president. And so Johnson started that to his credit, I guess. Yep. Um, yep. And it can carry it on. Every president's different. Um, I, I never wrote for Clinton, but I know people that wrote for PDBs for Clinton. And they right. said that um, he didn't care about stuff six months or a year out. He wanted to know what was going to happen next six weeks because he was right. watching the polls. Uh, now, by contrast, when I wrote for Bush, if you didn't write something that was six months down the road, your projection or longer, 
he didn't want to hear about it for the most part. Now that yeah. changed when when uh, Israel invaded Lebanon. That changed a little bit. But before that, he wanted stuff focused strategically so he can marshal U.S. resources and policy to make a change down the road. Not something that was right in his face. He'll just deal with that with the resource at hand. A very different approach than Clinton. Uh, both had their merits, but uh, more right. so Bush. But yeah, anyway, but that's but anything to, to to hit that thing hit that point one more time. Anything that was actually imminent or, or pressing is not going to be in, in, a, in a briefing like that. It's going to have its own standalone briefing. It's going to have its own standalone there's, conference. There's going, to, yeah. there's going to be a senior intelligence officer who comes over from Langley or from DIA or somewhere like that. They're going to be marched over to the um, to the National Security Council. And then from there, they're going to go into the, the briefing with the situation with right. the president, if necessary. And they're going yep. to be there. Or it's going to, these days it'll be VTC from the Pentagon or from, right. from Foggy Bottom or something like that. That's going yep. to happen instantaneously. I mean, when, when 9-11 happened, Intel people were on the horn. VTCs were up on twenty four seven, and people were getting. And Bush was getting that stuff fed to him in Air Force One in the air because they have all the capacity for that. So I mean, look, the, the president of the United States could run this country from the surface of the moon if we can maintain communications right. links. It doesn't yep. have to be in Washington. He could be in Crawford, Texas. He can be in Chicago. You know, hanging out with his gun buddies in Southside yep. with Barack Obama. It doesn't <laughs> matter as long as you have the communications. They can be anywhere. That's why yep. we send. All these aircraft and armored cars and hundreds of people around the world yeah. for presidential, you know, for tour. When Bush came to Africa, his last tour, just before he left office, he did seven country tour. And I was in the last country, which meant that right. um, we got mostly the vice president's people. So um, yeah. the vice president people, the guy I was dealing with was a bit um, a bit more junior as the Secret Service guy. And he was a little um, was a little Vietnamese American guy. And, and he was not very calm. So he was bouncing around and I'm standing there in my dress uniform and and I'm like, okay, dude, you got to calm down. The president's coming soon. So, so I, yeah. uh, I just kind of stood there politely. And when Bush got out of the vehicle, um, he walked over to me and, and I saluted him because he's chief executive. And then yep. he started talking to me. And the Secret Service agents started losing their freaking mind because I was brief. Don't talk to the president. He loves to talk to the military. Just, you know, just let, get him inside. And I tried, but he's like, hey, Colonel, so uh, listen, can I bring the president, the president of Liberia, can yep. I bring the president with me? I said, sir, it's, 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 your, it's your meeting. You're welcome to bring the president in with you if you like. Well, let me get her out here, Colonel. And sure. <laughs> hey, so, so, Colonel, where are you from? How long have you been in the Army? And the Secret Service is like, shut the frick up. Yeah, there yep. you go. You can just tell. Oh, but yeah. I'm like, hey, you know, the, yeah, Bush, chief- Bush, yeah, Bush loved to talk. And, you know, I'm wearing my 1600 Communications Association shirt right now. Uh, so I, I, I provided th- these comms around the world for the vice president, president, and you know, the White House military office in, in and of itself, and you can look up the White House military office, all the things that they provide and bring to the table uh, and support that that apparatus from moving from country to country or state to state or whatever it may be, uh, even even on a campaign, whether it's an in and out, uh, whether it's a, a remain overnight, what we call a RON, uh, whether maybe it could be an entire, you know, full, you know, West Coast swing or it could be an overseas swing to several countries. He's going to have everything that he needs at his disposal to be the president wherever he is in the world, like you said, on the moon. He, he would have it there. Yeah, that's why that's why when the media or, or, or political activists on both sides, oh, Trump's golfing, Obama's golfing. Who cares? I do care about Obama's family misusing Air Force transport to fly to Spain on vacation yeah, I do too, and yeah. going to New York City to have a steak that I have an issue with. That's that's fraud. That's corruption. But right. the president going on vacation. Look, the guy's entitled to vacation. And it's yep. not like he's ever on vacation. I mean, no. the moment something happens, they're right there. I mean, some dude walks up in uniform or from the CIA and goes, hey, sir. The crap's yep. hit the fan. You need to stop, drop the ball, take your handicap, and let's go into the side. Yep. I mean, I, I, every every day I'd get the president's schedule, the vice president's schedule, and you, you would look at it because you need to know where they're at on a, on a day-by-day basis, so especially if you're on duty for 24, 72 hours, 40, 48 hours, whatever it may be. You need to know where they're going to be. Uh, and whenever they're even on, on vacation, you know, it's Intel briefing, it's it's National Security Council, it's cabinet meeting, or it's, you know, it's an update, senior staff meeting. It's, it's There's always something. And then they'll have private time or they'll have like, you know, a scheduled time for them to be down to go dinner or whatever, play golf. Uh, but for the most part, they're having all the, the briefings that they actually need to actually have uh, wherever they are in the world. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Anyway. I stepped into that one pretty good, but I'm glad, yeah. I, I'm yeah, glad, yeah, I, I'm you, glad you, I did because look what it brought out. You know, that was also awesome. well, I, mean, you know, I mean, Todd yeah. and I only agreed to do this program so we could abuse you online. Yeah, yes. you know, that's, that's what it's about here. <laughs> Pick Probably. on the truck driver. <laughs> No, no, but you, you, you bring, obviously, you, you have a hell of a lot more knowledge than we do probably on, on transportation transportation policy and stuff like that. So, you know, you be, you'll beat the hell out of us whenever we start talking about that in a little You're while. Right. I, well, I, I mean, gra- listen, I got somewhat we, of a we, grasp we, on some things, a little bit of experience, and I can tell you right now that uh, the regulatory agencies are there to ignore you. Same thing with Congress. They're there to ignore you. You can write all the letters yeah. you want to. You're lucky if you get a response. 
No, but John, come on. I mean, listen, our, our exalted transportation secretary, our failed small town Indianapolis, Indiana mayor, I mean, he's really on top of things. I mean, this guy, I saw this brilliant one minute video the other day. Uh, I wanted to drop everything and become, you know, uh, an ensign in the transportation corps the other day. <laughs> he's, he's definitely on the green agenda. I'll tell you what, they've got him on yeah, the whole ba- a yeah. Biden plan there. Uh, he, he's bought a hook, hook, line, and sinker to the point he's willing to put on the dog and pony show where he got out of the SUV with the two security mm-hmm. guards, the certain Secret Service guys. R- road, yeah, rode road his bicycle blocks. to two blocks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, I saw him in an elevator. He was telling us about how many jobs would be created by their brilliant plan. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, I, I don't take a lot of advice from failed small town mayors. It really doesn't impress me. No, I can imagine. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, or or anybody who who has some sort of uh, political favor that they owe somebody, you know, or a secretary of state who. Uh, I, I'll tell I'll tell you this. I, I posted this on Facebook the other day. I said I may say something about it on our on our depending on what we talk about uh, about our. Tony Blinken, Anthony Blinken, our secretary of state. This was way back whenever Obama and Biden just came into office. He was Biden's national security advisor. And on many occasions, I would be on duty with, you know, with mill aid. And, of course, we'd have an Air Force driver in the control vehicle. And, of course, you'd have a national security representative, whether it's chief of staff, whether it's the NSA himself, or some, or maybe one or two other people who'd be a senior level that's read on to certain program would be in that vehicle with us. Uh, and he, he, on many occasions, I rode with him. Uh, you know, whether it's to the vice president's residence or, or to an event or what have you. And this guy, let me tell you, he's so entitled. I mean, the family that he comes from, I don't want to make fun of his family, probably good people. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. But very wealthy New York family. Uh, never had to really work or work hard for anything him, himself. Uh, never really had to go out and actually do anything. And it, of course, it showed through in the, his personal interactions with people that were that were beneath him, the way he just talked to people. And then, of course, he was so inept as far as national security. Here he is, the national security advisor, obviously a political favor. Uh, you know, he's he's going to give the vice president advice uh, on things that affect the entire could affect the entire world uh, in, in a lot of respects. Or especially people's lives are on the line, and he had no clue of, of the most basics. Uh, whenever it comes to say national security, what what all the Department of Defense has at, at its disposal, he's asking the military all these questions, basic stuff that you know a, 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 a very junior NCO in the in the military would know. And he, here he is, a national security advisor to the second most powerful person in the world, and he didn't know the most basic stuff. Uh, you know, so well out of his depth there. Uh, and of course, I imagine he still is as Secretary of State. But anyway, that's some behind the scenes commentary there. Well, I mean, it, it looks in, um, yeah, now he's Secretary of State and the right. world's on fire. Uh, Myanmar, yep. military junta takes over on the 1st of February. Mali arrested their interim president, prime minister and minister of defense. And right. where is where is their comments on that? Tigray, they finally took action against Ethiopia with some sanctions. But all Thank it really you. does is, is, is it just stops travel from, you know, right. executives and the government. Right. It doesn't stop. Ethiopia is the single largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid in Africa. And that's not changing. They also get lots of military assistance from us that they shouldn't be getting. Yep. Um, and I know I was there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Tigray, Ethiopia, Algeria, the city of Algiers is in flames. People burning shops and looting just a few weeks or just a week and a half ago. Nothing said by this government. Right. Uh, now we, we see, we saw some Myanmar. I've already, already mentioned that with Burma, what's going on there. Uh, Mozambique, the Cabo Delgado province, and with uh, you know people being murdered and hacked apart yep. by an Islamist insurgency, not a word to be said. And, of course, the Sahel in Africa continues to be in flames. And, of course, the one, the most obvious one, uh, well, two of them, actually, Belarus, um, a Ryan air flight forced to the ground by a combat jet fighter. I mean, what kind of international arm is this file? But of course, they have lots of experience in that. It was the Russians that shot down KLL 007 yeah. years ago with the U.S. congressman on it. But then the biggest one of all. I mean, we had peace in the Middle East in the yep. first time in a, in a generation yep. under the Trumpster. And, Morocco and, and, esta- reestablished relations. All these Arab states established relations for the first time with Israel. They were peace. And yep. now we're right back in the same garbage we were in under the Intifada with Clinton. Don't forget Absolutely. that the orange man shut down the the yellow man. Remember that? Oh, you talk you talking about uh, Kim Chung? Uh, yeah, Kim, Kim Jong Un. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and he, he brought he brought him to the table, and how you have a, you had a President Trump who walked into North Korea for crying out loud. I mean, man. who who else who else could do something like that? Biden's not going to do that. Yeah, no, it's and you know, and, and what was their answer at the time? Oh, well, he just he, he just you know, he gave he gave gravitas to North Korea. No, he didn't, not at all. Does the world think any better of North Korea? What a joke! No, what he no did, not at he all. Realized, he realized that Kim Jong un wanted his ego stroke. That's and it. if you stroke the guy's ego, you'll get something. He wanted Instead to be recognized they, as a world leader. So Trump went over there, shook his hand, had right. a conversation. The guy shut up. 
Right. And, yeah. what, and what is the progressive approach to North Korea? Make a boring ass film with Seth Rogen and uh, James Franco that insults North Korea. It's actually kind of funny. It, it is funny. Insults, <laughs> insults North Korea. That's the left's respect. You know, and like, well, Trump didn't accomplish anything. Well, let's see. They stopped firing intercontinental ballistic missiles over Japanese airspace. I'd call that an accomplishment. Stop, yeah. stop uh, testing nukes for a, for, a, for a long time, too. To my understanding, yeah, he what, fired that program back up once Biden went in. Oh, right, absolutely. And yeah, but now, I don't. I don't think they've gone over the Japanese airspace yet, though. No, but they and, will. And, and of course, now the Chinese incursions in Taiwan are, you know, in Taiwan's so scared that. Oh, the, the, oh, oh, no, 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 no! Stop, <laughs> stop. I got to stop you, Todd. Go ahead. Listen, go ahead. The, the 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 esteemed political scientist and noted historian John Cena, John Cena. <laughs> star of of a Fast and Furious version nine, because Paul Walker unfortunately is dead. Otherwise, this clown wouldn't be on there. John Cena, the, the exalted uh, political scientist, has apologized in Mandarin, no less. Yes. And, and not three words, but like two minutes he was reading Mandarin. I, I don't know how if he butchered or not, but he sounded kind of Mandarinese to me. Right. And he apologized <laughs> for calling Taiwan a country. Um, clearly, he's not familiar with history. You see, Taiwan is a country. The island of yep. Formosa was part of China. The Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek fled there after losing, after winning the war against the Japanese. They lost to the communists who hid in the mountains when the Chinese were all fighting against the Japanese. There weren't many. The communists were fighting, but they didn't do much. They were mostly killing nationalists, not killing Japanese. The nationalists were fighting off the communists and killing Japanese. And anyway, and then the war ended. So they were so wiped out by this two-decade-long war that the they, Kuomintang had to retreat. They went to Formosa, and it became Taiwan. And it was legitimate government of China, recognized by the entire world, including the Security Council, until the betrayal of Taiwan under James Earl Carter. That's right. Absolutely correct. And, of course, n- now they're wondering if the U.S. would even come to their aid. And I don't believe that we actually would. Uh, if Biden has to make that call uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I don't think that we would. Well, it just shows you how cynical and feckless and useless all these so-called celebrities and clowns are. I mean, right. LeBron James kowtowing to the Chinese Communist Party and then telling us we have a systemically racist country when what they do to Uyghurs over there, what they do to Muslims yep. over there. And and and, 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 and Sena now, you know, obviously they think their bread is buttered in China. And, and then I saw the CNN article telling me how China is the biggest movie market in the world. Who cares? People pay three cents to watch a movie in China. Here we have to pay 16 bucks. They're making money here, not in China. If right. the movie theater That's didn't go out of correct. business due to COVID. Hey, I've been, oh, going right. to them all, I've been going to them all along by myself. Nobody else was there. <laughs> you buy out all the seats. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was standing at a parts counter at, at a truck dealership here recently. And I see a sign says, you know, masks are no longer enforced here in New Hampshire. But I, yeah. I see a sign that says masks are required to enter the building. So I'm holding this mask. and I'm like, oh, Jesus. So I put on the mask. And I go inside. There's this big plastic partition in front of me, you know, plexiglass. And I see all these people on the other side of the plexiglass. And none of them are wearing masks. I go, oh, we don't need masks. Right. Oh, no, sir, you need your mask. I'm like, but I'm standing here alone behind the glass. <laughs> yeah, and you're not well, wearing masks on the other side. Exactly. Well, I did see some for the first time I hadn't been out, you know, playing the role of hermit because, you know, it's not safe. I'm terrified to go out in the age of the pandemic. But uh, I was in Carlisle this week and um, I noticed that things have changed. I went uh, on post. I didn't have to wear my mask to go in the gate, which is a nice, nice bit of sense. Um, It said that I don't have to wear a mask if I'm fully vaccinated in the exchange. And I won't answer whether I did or didn't uh, and whether I am because I identify as vaccinated. So that's all you need to know Um, (laughs) if I can identify if I can identify as trans. I can identify as vaccinated, you know. Right. Gender, Wait a minute, you it's, it's identify as trans too? Well, why not? I mean, it's going to get me reinstated on YouTube if I'm trans because they they'll be transphobic, they'll yeah. be terrified. I so, thought you um, might say trans am or something. <laughs> or or, 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 or say you identify. I, you identify as a gender that's yet to be determined or there yet you to go. be identified. That's right. Yeah. So, so anytime in the future you'll be discriminated against yeah. me, even though you don't know what I am. But right. uh, so, so that, so that was that was there. Then I went uh, to the post office. The signs requiring a mask come down and said, "We encourage you to wear a mask." Okay, that's rational. That's, you want to wear a mask? Right. That's cool. And then I went to low or to Lowe's, and there was. No signs for mask at all. The degree of rationality has come back into this. That was uh, quite encouraging. But by the way, folks, last week we reported May 18th. We, it was the day before we had our show last week uh, that we had two constitutional amendments, both of which passed. And I was shocked that 45 percent of these sheep would actually vote to allow the governor to have unfettered um, dictatorial control. But they did pass. The Constitution is being amended. But two days later, Tom Wolf gave us his middle finger and extended his unconstitutional lockdown for 90 more days. He doesn't have the authority to do it. But because the, the, the amendments have to be certified by the yeah. state, he took advantage of it. And that's how little he cares about Pennsylvanians. He said, F you. 
I have the authority just because you passed the Constitution Amendment to take power away from me that I usurped from the legislature. I'm going to screw you after all. So our con- our lockdown has been extended for 90 days until that's rescinded by the legislature. This is just this is disgraceful and shameful. Meanwhile, Gretchen Whitmer is caught without a mask, breaking the rules that she signed a week prior yep. at a place. And then she gives some lame excuse. Well, we, we didn't know all these people were going to show up bull. Uh, yeah, and and right. none of them are wearing masks. It's just they're just frauds. You know, the whole yeah. list of all these leftist frauds. They don't take it. Yeah, seriously. Gov- that's like Pelosi, yeah, yeah. you know, finding people five thousand. What she find three, four people, five thousand dollars a piece. For right. Which, which, which she can't actually do constitutionally anyway. She can't she can't take their money anyway. Uh, and, and if that's the case, then she can take their money and say, well, if you don't vote yay on this, then I'm going to take some money. You know, that's the next thing that's on the on the docket, obviously. But she the point is she's not wearing a mask. No, of course. No, no, nobody it. was wearing a mask. I saw the photographs, not a single person. And none of them were even six feet apart. They're sitting at a table like people normally do in a restaurant. Yeah. And then they yeah. and then they post it on social media. What a bunch of brain. This is the problem with leftists. They're so stupid. They expose themselves. I mean, Maxine Waters. Oh, the, oh, the racist Trump. And they're, they're, they're destroying the black people. I, I'm sorry. Uh, Donald Trump just gave five hundred million dollars historically black college universities no president in american history has ever done that he came up with the um, what's it not the diamond plan or whatever it's called for community restoration right he came up with opportunity zones yep. you know the, it's, the, the wealth gap between black americans and the rest of the society closed demonstrably in the four years that trump was in office mm-hmm. and all, he, he, oh yeah criminal justice reform he did that obama never even touched that nope. didn't care about it but he's a racist he's a racist it's mm. just utter nonsense these people are so bankrupt and people are such sheep that they get away with it. Bingo. You're absolutely correct. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're, we're pushing at 9 o'clock right now, so we're going to have to break out of here at the hour and a half mark. Uh, folks, yep. appreciate you guys tuning in for the uh, Common Sense Conservatives. Uh, we'll be back again next week, uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, hopefully, if you didn't get to catch us live, you've caught us uh, you know, on a replay or something like that at your own uh, leisure. Uh, but anyway, take care, guys. Appreciate you all, and we'll see you next weekend or next week. Sorry. All right. Good. Good night, everybody. Ciao. And I got no volume.